to describe my life from the beginning. It's been a relentless pursuit of significance. I wanted to be great. I wanted to be a, a rock star. And I know there's many of you out here, you know, uh, writhing in there and, and, and maybe some wanting to chase out the demons. But l- let's face it, ever since kids, ever since we were small, we really wanted significance. I mean, we wanted to be the astronaut or we wanted to be that football star. And even, you know, we're combing the hair of the doll. None of us said, I want to be a mediocre mom. I mean, we, so we, we wanted significance in our life. And I pursued it with, with, with a, a vehemence. And for me, that significance, it came to me as a 15-year-old that I was going to be an author. And I was going to be a best-selling author and write the great American uh, novel. And I went on that pursuit uh, with a, a lot of vigilance. By the time I was 17, I had written my first novel. And it was so good that I had a friend who uh, offered to read it, and I never asked for it back. Ho- hopefully it's in a landfill somewhere right now. My second novel that I wrote uh, at age 20, I was going to solve all of the um, puzzles of the universe. And of course, I didn't finish that one. And then the third one was a self-published one. So by the time I got in college, I was on my fourth novel with this, this plan, this great blueprint that I had for success. And uh, I got as far in the fourth novel as developing the title, Flight of the Earls, uh, a his, a, a Irish historical fiction. And at this time, I was really beginning to get discouraged because I, I applied for a graduate school for writing and didn't make it. It was one of the first times in my life where things just weren't working or happening I- in my way. And, and I was frustrated with that because I felt that all the doors were closed and there wasn't opportunity. Well, it was shortly after that 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 God intervened in my life and put amazing men and amazing uh, people that were to to mentor me. And I I began to to walk with God and I began to see with God, but I was so new and and it it was so exciting for me. And then I heard of this concept that I could be a mighty man of God. So I could have my old world of being significant, of being great, of being a rock star, but I'd get to do it for God, so it would, be, it would be all right. And forget all the other verses, that was the one that really stuck out for me. Well, this process, um, for me, I, I, I started my business, and, and my idea behind this of being a mighty man of God is I'm going to do this business, it's going to be a godly business, and I'm going to do things for God. And so with my agency, we would do logos for churches, and we would do, there would be evangelical groups coming in the area, and, and we would volunteer and do work with them. And I had this vision that 50% of our, our work we would donate for them, and I would be, be this honored position, being this mighty man of God. Well, as you can imagine, the ladder of success often ends up in this position, and I was, there was a main problem that I had. Um, I was a fraud, and I was a fake. I had this business that in the community I was well respected and people thought I was this great servant and this great help. But meanwhile, my staff hated me. Uh, I had a partnership that was failing and my wife resented the business because it was taking everything that we owned. Basically, I was borrowing to give. And it was at this point that I was at really a bro- broken point and saying, I, I want to be significant. I want to I serve you and I want to I do things for you. And it's not working. And it was at that point where God, we all have these points in our life, where uh, God took me to a peacemakers organization with my partner. And I had approached this with, with this idea that I was going to go with a stack of papers and explain you know, what great things I had done and all the reasons why I was right in this, this uh, situation. And I showed up to this. And, and it only took about 15 minutes in the process. It usually takes a day or so. It took me 15 minutes. And God broke me to where I spent the next two hours bawling my head off, apologizing to my partner for everything that I had wronged him. And just when I thought I could be finished and be done with it, he gave me a whole other scroll of things that I had to apologize. And at that very moment, I learned four words. I might be wrong. And I also learned an insight into something that I was struggling with, is that people are as important as I am. And it was an amazing thing. It was at this very point that God brought into my world the darkness. And the darkness was in meth. And I got involved in a project that we had learned in our community that some 80 to 90% of all the crime in our community was a result of meth. And so me, being that I would help out, I volunteered in this organization to make some posters that we would, we would send out to the schools in our area. Well, 
that grew into that we would do some uh, co we would do some commercials for them. So I went and did the commercials, uh, and I, I went to go meet with the general managers of the TV stations to see if they would air it. And one of them said, "Have you ever thought of doing a 30-minute documentary and airing it in a roadblock?" Well, at that time, I did not know what a document what a, what a roadblock was, which means all the stations block out just like they do with the president's address, and they air only that program. And the, and the gentleman said, you could do this, but none of the general managers will agree to it. So I thought, well, this, this is more than I was going to volunteer. This is more than I was going to do, but this sounds like a good idea. So I went to the first general manager with the idea that I had my presentation of why this would be a good thing, and please get on board within five minutes. He stopped and said, we're on board. I went to the next general manager. Within five minutes, he stopped us. He said, we're on board. Went to all the general managers, and within a short period of time, we had all of the general managers agreeing to air this documentary that would be an anti-meth documentary on all of the stations. The problem was we didn't have a documentary. In three months, we began to see how God was going to work in this amazing, amazing process. Very early on, I started filming this, this um, and I was sitting there doing the interview. We had interviewed a lot of people. We were at a jail, and they came and said, there's a problem. We, the people that were supposed to show up haven't showed up. We're down to one, one young lady. She's just finished taking a shower, and she, she really wants to do and tell her story. This, this young lady named Tennille had lived a life beyond hell and beyond difficulties, all the way down to her childhood. And she sat as we started rolling the film for this and told her story. At that very moment, it was a very pivotal moment. The cameras, we faded back, and she rose, and I could hear that God was ready to tell his story. And that finally, he was willing to do something broke, significant with someone who was broken and willing to step back. From that story that she shared, we ended up doing this documentary. We needed to get websites. We needed to do uh, everything to do for this whole process. My little tiny company was at the point of going bankrupt. We thought that this program would air. The first time that the TV stations ever saw this documentary was the day before it aired. And God intervened. It was believed to be the most watched program of all time in our community. The community came together like, like nothing that we've ever seen. And I was relieved because I was done until the first lady of Nevada said, hey, you did this for Northern Nevada, you're gonna get me in trouble if you don't do it for Southern Nevada. And so we did the campaign in Las Vegas, most watched program of all time, and I thought I was done. God wasn't finished. We get a call from Oregon, they wanna do, they wanna do uh, uh, in Portland. Well, it turned out that spread to the entire state of Oregon, then Sacramento, then San Diego, and this is all of the stations agreeing to, to air these documentaries, massive campaigns. We went to the state of Arizona. Now, granted, this is this little tiny company that's led by a, a very inadequate manager. We went to the state of Arizona. 100% of their TV stations aired this program and participated in it. They had 62 TV stations that aired it. We went to this beautiful state of New Mexico. Uh, all of the stations came on board with this, and as a result of New Mexico, El Paso decided they wanted to do this as well. And El Paso says, we're only going to do this if Ciudad Juarez can be a partner in it. And so we did it uh, in, in, in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez for the first time ever. They had the two mayors come on El Puente and have a joint press conference. They had to have Homeland Security clear it for three weeks. We went in and filmed in the ghettos of Ciudad Juarez where they had over a thousand drug-related murders that year and God protected us while our cameras rolled and, and we did this. These campaigns started to spring out all over the place and when I went to the Ciudad Juarez campaign and showed up for it, I saw God working in an amazing way and I showed up excited to see our documentary. The government had, had decided to edit it themselves. It wasn't my program at all and you know what? It didn't matter because God was in charge. We got contacted by Sonora, Mexico, the whole state. They did their own program. We went to Colorado and did the entire state. And here we are working with, with governors and working with, with state leaders. And then in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, between 1.5 million and 2 million people watched the program, which was over half of their population. And with that, they had 270 locations across the state where people gathered in churches and gathered together as a community to watch this. Through this program, 
I, I learned about the incredible darkness that there was with this and incredible things that were going on. With this drug, we learned about children being in unbelievable situations. Mothers selling their child, their eight-year-old child, to prostitution to sell their drug debts. Uh, children going and doing drugs with their mom because they felt this was a way that they could connect. Incredible darkness, suicide, different things. And through this whole process, learned what a, what a small piece any of my worries or any of my troubles and what a great thing for God to use me in any way or any capacity whatsoever. We had people come to us from New Zealand. We had people come to us, a, a, a group from Russia that came to us. South Korea came all from this whole piece and mainly, once again, because he could only use someone that was, that was broken and knew that significance wasn't important. To roll the story back again, because if you remember my whole my whole focus was to be a writer, is that 20 years later, um, I was brought to a friend to a writer's conference, and I hadn't written a single word of fiction in 20 years because I had given up on the whole dream because God, I learned, had laid my pen down because he wouldn't have liked what I would have written. I sat across the table from uh, an editor, and for whatever reason, God gave me the courage to give a pitch of that story, Flight of the Earls. And I started off with, with saying, because it's impossible to get a publishing contract, and I started off with saying, I am um, a producer of a documentary that uh, has impacted more than 20 million peop 30 million people and that won an Emmy. And they said, we're listening. And then I pitched the story and that what hasn't even written, and praise God, uh, we have a writing contract for a historical novel fiction that's coming out, a trilogy. Beyond that, we have another contract, and we have other pu publishers interested in it. And what I'm most excited about is it's going to be of God. And the only thing that matters in the mighty man of God, because we go to that mighty man part. It sounds good, right? And the mighty woman, and to be a great mom, and to be a great worker, and to be great at what we want to do. It's that it's of God. And I leave us with this question that we would ask each of ourselves because it's one that I have to ask myself daily, hourly, and by the minute. We are all willing to lay our burdens at the foot of the cross. Are we willing to lay our desires? Amen.